All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice exam series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're turning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. Danny Ocean is organizing a plot to steal from Terry Benedict's casinos. Part of the plot involves sneaking past a couple of security guards. After observing the guards, Danny determines that the guards walk away from their designated post every two hours. What is Danny measuring? Measurement questions. Measurement questions, as you get more fluent and stronger on the exam, will become fairly straightforward. Now let's just identify first, what are we measuring? Well, Danny needs to know about the security guard's behavior specifically when do they walk away from their post so if the behavior is walking away from the post and we have response one two hours later response two two hours later response three so on and so forth what are we measuring well, we're measuring time in between responses or into response time so we look at a occurrence occurrence has to do with frequency and rate, right? How many times something happens. Here we're dealing with time in between. Temporal extent. Temporal extent has to do with duration, the extent of the response. What we're looking at is temporal locus. We're looking at a location in time, a location in a period of time. In other words, time in between these responses. When or how long in between responses are we observing? In this case, it's going to be two hours. The permanent product is the product of the behavior, the outcome, then he's not measuring product, he's not measuring outcome, he's measuring into response time, which comes from temporal locus. Usain is tired of losing to his friends in a card game called Magic the Gathering. Usain goes home and watches several videos on strategies and tips. The next day, Usain implements what he saw in the videos into his own games. Usain is demonstrating what? So in the new task list, we have this distinction between imitation and observational learning. Now, what is the difference? With imitation, imitation needs to be immediate, right? We're planning a model which leads to imitation. And we want that imitation to be immediate, meaning I model, the imitation happens right away. With observational learning, we are still, or the learner or whoever is still observing the environment, but the behavior doesn't necessarily happen immediately. So in this case, Usain goes home, he, he watches videos on strategy and tips, and then the next day, a full day goes by, he still implements what he saw into his own games. So Usain has demonstrated observational learning. Now, what is generative learning? Generative learning is the ability to take prior learned skills and apply them in new context and in new strategies and in new ways. Usain is simply just taking what he saw and putting it into practice. He's not engaging in new behaviors. He's not engaging in new skills. He's taking what he observed. He learned it. He applied it. So Usain is demonstrating observational learning. This is very close to what we used to consider an unplanned model, except it's not imitation, right? So it's not technically a model, right? Because imitation happens right away. The main difference between imitation and observational learning is that observational learning does not happen immediately. Clark just put in a pool at his house after receiving his Christmas bonus. He tells his son Rusty that he must be safe and only swim when someone is around. Clark installs a gate with a handle that turns green when it is okay to swim. Following differential reinforcement, Rusty now only goes in the pool when the handle is green. What is the handle functioning as? So we're looking at the handle. What do we know so far? We know Rusty is only allowed to swim when it's safe. The gate has a handle that turns green when it is okay to swim. And Rusty is reinforced when the handle is green. So what do we know about the handle? Well, we know when the handle is green, let's just call the stimulus green, and Rusty goes swimming, he gets reinforced. When the stimulus is not green, let's just call stimulus not green, he goes swimming, this is extinction. And so eventually this behavior reinforced in the presence of the green stimulus leads to what? Well, it leads to the green stimulus having stimulus control over Rusty's behavior. 
And when that handle gains stimulus control, signaling reinforcement is available, what do we consider that? A, a motivating operation. The handle is not increasing the value of swimming. Rusty may want to swim, but if the handle isn't green, he can't. So what the handle is doing is signaling the availability of swimming. It isn't a prompt, right? Because that has to be there. Prompts are just additional cues. The handle needs to be green. Green is what is actually signaling to Rusty it's okay to swim. And then the consequence. Well, it's not the consequence because it's the antecedent stimulus, right? So it can't be a consequence if it's an antecedent. The handle is functioning as a discriminative stimuli or stimulus. A clinical supervisor wants to ensure that staff members are implementing plans with fidelity to evaluate the accuracy of implementation. The supervisor observes sessions and measures how closely the staff adhere to intervention steps, as well as the frequency with which they deliver reinforcement within the specified time frame. Given that the sessions occur in a busy environment with frequent interruptions, which measurement procedure would be most appropriate for the director's goals? It's a long question, right? Even I sometimes on these longer questions can lose my focus. It's why we always make sure to attack the question before trying to jump to the answer choices. So much information. So let's just start. What does the question ask? It asks about the measurement procedure that's, that's most appropriate. We know the sessions are in a busy environment with a lot of interruptions. And immediately when you see that in measurement questions, you've got to start thinking discontinuous. If I'm in a busy env environment with frequent interruptions, continuous measurement is going to be difficult. Now, what is the director or the supervisor trying to establish, right? What are we trying to work through? And don't get confused by director and supervisor. You've got to parse through the question and how it's set out, right? We're talking about the supervisor here. They want the staff to implement plans with fidelity. And so they want to evaluate accuracy right? And then frequency of reinforcement. But there's a busy environment and frequent interruptions. What's the best way they're going to be able to achieve their goal given restraints? A, continuous measurement in real time. That is ideal, right? To be able to continuously measure every occurrence would be fantastic. Given it's a busy environment with interruptions, that does not always seem possible. What about B, time sampling with a focus on the key elements of the plan? Yes, a very focused measurement plan using time sampling is likely going to lead to better outcomes than trying to force a continuous measurement procedure in an environment that just is not conducive to that type of measurement. C, event recording for reinforcement delivery. Event recording is continuous, but we suffer the same issue as A. And then D, cumulative record of the behaviors that are done correctly. Well, cumulative records might give you a total number of correct responses, but it's not going to, going to give you a lot of information outside of that, right? Cumulative records are very specific to very specific situations. The best way to measure here, given what we know about our constraints, is B, time sampling with a focus, on key elements of the plan. A software developer learns how to code in one programming language called Python. Later, when introduced to a new programming language, they quickly pick up the new language's syntax and structure without needing extensive instruction. The developer's ability to apply previously learned concepts to this new skill demonstrates which of the following. Well, we just so happened to talk about this idea in a couple questions ago, right? In our, in our observational learning question. And what do we say we call it when we can take these previous concepts and start to apply them to new skills. Because in this case, this developer knows a programming language. They go to learn a new programming language. And because they know this old one, they pick up on the new one very quickly. Why is that? Well, they already have all these concepts, all these skills that they can now apply to the new skill. So what do we call that? A, stimulus generalization. With stimulus generalization, we have a response that occurs in the presence of multiple stimuli. And we're not really generalizing a response here, right? Because it's a new skill, it's a new concept, a new response entirely. Response generalization, where we have a stimulus that is evoking multiple responses. Again, we're not really looking at generalization so much here because we have a brand new skill, right? 
But what we're doing is applying previously learned ideas and concepts, and it's making the new skill easier. And that's what we call generative learning. Then symmetry, of course, is stimulus equivalence. A equals B, B equals A. Not applying here. We're talking concepts, taking old concepts, applying them to new ideas. That's what we consider generative learning. A behavior technician observes their client running from their parents and laughing regardless of the setting. The technician is concerned that this might be a serious safety issue. The analyst on the case writes a behavior plan for the elopement. What should the mastery criterion be? So this is both a planning question and an ethical question because we are setting a mastery criterion for elopement. And what do we consider elopement given our information? Client running from parents regardless of setting. The real issue is becomes it's a safety problem. So when we have a safety problem, what do we want mastery to be? We want mastery to be 100%. The idea that 80% mastery is the standard is just not true. There's nothing that says 80% mastery is a standard. Mastery needs to be based on your goal, the ability level, and what you're trying to achieve. If this is a safety issue and you want to be ethical, what do you need to teach this to? 80, 90, or 100%. What's well, got to be 100%, right? We can't afford to teach the 80% and have 20% of the time it not occurring. Or in this case, the elopement does occur. Even 90%. If they're running away 10% of the time and it's a serious safety issue, that leaves a lot of potential for the client to come into danger. And our first objective is do no harm. So if we have a serious safety concern, it's a safety skill, we have to teach to 100% mastery. A therapist is working with a client who frequently engages in hand flapping during quiet activities, which interferes with the client's ability to complete tasks. The therapist decides to reinforce the client for keeping their hands folded in their lap while engaging in these activities. After observing significant improvements, the therapist adjusts the reinforcement schedule to fade any prompts. Which of the following best describes the primary behavioral strategy being used? Now, we're looking at behavior strategy, right? Behavior strategy question. What do we know so far? We know we have a client who engages in hand flapping, and it's become an issue. Therapist is now teaching a new behavior, right? Hands folded in lap. So immediately, old behavior, hand flapping, new behavior, hands folded in lap. One is getting reinforced, right? One is not. So the question becomes, because this is differential reinforcement, are these compatible? Well, no. Can you hand flap and fold your hands in your lap? Absolutely not. So what kind of strategy is it? A, an alternative differential reinforcement strategy. Well, an alternative differential reinforcement strategy or differential reinforcement of alternative behaviors involves teaching a replacement, but the replacement can occur at the same time. If we're teaching a replacement that can't occur at the same time, then it's going to have to be incompatible. Lower rates and higher rates both have to do with increasing or decreasing an already existing behavior, not teaching a replacement. We're teaching a replacement using differential reinforcement that cannot occur at the same time as the old behavior. Strategy being used is D, incompatible differential reinforcement. You're sitting with your supervisor as they discuss with a parent a new target challenging behavior that just emerged. The parent says the behavior does sometimes seem to happen for attention and sometimes to gain access to toys, but the behavior also happens whenever the client is by themselves or already has toys and attention. What would you hypothesize is the function? So pretty straightforward function question. It's one of the most clear giveaways in a function question because what do we know? We know the parent says behavior happens for attention, okay, access, so tangible, but also when the client is by themselves or already has what they want. And that's the clear giveaway. If the behavior is happening when the client is by themselves and when they already have everything they need, what are we going to hypothesize? A, tangible. Well, it does sometimes gain access to toys, but even when they have toys, the behavior is happening. Escape. The parent never mentioned escape. What about C? Attention. Same as attention, right? It happens for attention, but even when they already have attention. And it also happens when they're by themselves. Given all that information, it's much more likely that the behavior is automatic 
than the other possible functions. A behavior technician is scrolling TikTok and comes across a trend that she thinks her clients would love. The next day during group time, she gets the clients all together and films them participating in the trend. Clients have a great time and all the parents love the video. The technician now wants to post it to their social media. What should you, the behavior analyst, do? Another pretty straightforward question. As you practice and you work on this and you get fluent, you're going to start to notice patterns, right? One, everything on the task list connects. And two, there's only so many different ways questions can be asked. And a lot of times the answer is very straightforward, especially in ethics. And when it comes to social media, we have some very firm rules about social media, right? In this case, you have a technician who is using TikTok as maybe reinforcement with their clients or rapport building, whatever it is, everyone enjoys it, right? The clients get together, clients loving it, parents loving it, fantastic. But technician wants to post it on their social media. What's the hard and fast rule of social media? You can't post your personal social media. So what should you do? Hey, reprimand the technician for filming the clients. Well, no, if the parents are okay with it and the clients love it, there's nothing wrong with filming the clients. It's how we use that video. B, remind the technician that she cannot post clients to her social media. Yeah, you just can't, as the technician, post your personal media. You, as the analyst, can also not post your personal social media. Only business accounts allow for this with express consent and disclaimers. C, obtain consent from parents prior to allowing the technician to post their social media. We cannot blend personal and the professional. D, allow the technician to make the post. You should not, right? No matter how much everyone loved it, the parents are okay with it, it's just not allowed, right? Just because of potential conflicts of interest and dual relationships. So with ethics, when we have these hard and fast rules, you've got to adhere to those on the exam. That's what the exam is testing you on. Do you understand the actual rules that are in place? A calculus teacher is frustrated that his class continues to ask for extensions on deadlines as they repeatedly miss due dates. The calculus teacher tells them that if they want to succeed in the real world, then they'll need to hold themselves accountable. The calculus teacher now requires each student to grade their own assignments and quizzes and score themselves. What generalization strategy does this represent? So we are, once again, looking at generalization strategies. We have a lot of gener generalization strategies, which indicates or should indicate to you how important generalization is and that we plan for it. We don't just wait and see. In this case, you have a calculus teacher who is frustrated with his class for deadlines and due dates. So they say, he says, you need to hold yourselves accountable. I am now going to make you grade yourself. Now, what would the, would the calculus teacher be doing if he is now having the students rely on themselves? A, program common stimuli. The calculus teacher isn't necessarily programming new or important aspects of the environment. He's simply saying it's time to manage yourself, right? B, self-management. You need to hold yourself accountable. General case analysis is planning for generalization. And D, indiscriminable contingencies is when we are disguising the contingency or when the consequence is available. This is not a case where the, the contingency is disguised. This is a case of teaching self-management. Thank you for watching. Be sure to subscribe and share. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.